Hello, how are you all? Are you well? Awesome. It's the last time I'm going to get to do that. It's quite nice. Um, well, I, I, he does tell me to pitch, but I was thinking maybe a bit of a holiday. I might hire a cottage. Just have a bit of time out. So yeah, if you haven't been here before, um, my name is Christos Reed or Failnaut on Twitter and in indie games development. Um, and I've been talking here for quite a while. Um, yeah, I started with a marketing panel uh, and over time have just talked about literally everything that's popped into my head. Uh, Jake's had a lot of faith in me over the course of these talks. Um, I believe his original pitch was just send me whatever the fuck you're going to do next month and we'll just do it. And given the average topics and weird slides and repeated angry references to Mass Effect's Mako, I'm genuinely really <laughs> fucking surprised he's continued to let it run that way. Um, my talks are basically comprised of this Venn diagram for the most part. I feel like I would be remiss uh, to not put Venn diagrams in my talks because it's pretty much one of the things I like most to do. Um, I don't know why. I think it's just it's very satisfying drawing circles in PowerPoint. It feels like the most stable thing you can do in it, which is why I'm running this as a PDF. <laughs> so, I wanted to talk to you about two things. I mean, I'm aware this is an esports event, uh, which is an interesting one to say goodbye on. Um, I play Dota. I used to play Dota quite a lot. I would say I played Dota to quite an unhealthy degree at one point, and nobody taught me that you weren't supposed to play the same character over and over and over and over again. Although, I will say Pip is the most patient team captain I've ever had. I don't think I've ever fucked up a Dota game as royally as I fucked that up, and she was incredibly emotionally supportive throughout. also seemingly a suicidally relentless optimist. Um, but yeah, I wanted to talk to you about two things. I wanted to talk to you about why I think video games are important as a medium, and I wanted to talk to you about something else, which I haven't told Jake I'm going to talk about. <laughs> Don't worry, stick with me. This is going to be weird. I've also realised I didn't actually ever start the timer, so we'll just wing it. Um, could have been a minute, could have been ten, who knows, anxiety is a terrible stopwatch. Um, I wanted to talk to you about the capability of games and why I think they're so fucking fascinating and why they're so important to me. I want to talk to you about the capability of what they can do and I wanted to talk to you about some of the topics that have come up recently in regards to the things I discuss around video games that make them so important to me. The first is politics. <laughs> I heard someone say recently, in fact I heard a lot of people say recently, get your fucking politics out of my fucking video games. And they were really passionate about it. They're also really passionate about the fact that video games are an art form. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure politics are in all art. Politics is in everything we do. And it's kind of fascinating really because We've gone from having to really stretch to discuss politics in games, to talk about the concept of the military via Gears of War and Halo and very direct comparisons like Medal of Honor and Call of Duty, to being able to look at really, really interesting games like Papers, Please, that discuss what it's like to work at the border control office of a fictional uh, Eastern European state. And it's pretty fascinating that video games have been able to do that because it's something that nobody ever thinks about and the best thing about it was that it was made with such finesse and to such a high degree of quality that it taught people a lot about that process and introduced them to the idea that you could make video games directly about politics and it could be interesting. The other fascinating aspect is that politics are in any, every video game you're ever going to play because they're in the heads of all of us when we make these games. Loads of my games are really heavy social, uh, heavily social-political, discuss how mental health is treated in society, 
and discuss how sexuality is treated in society. And those are things that I couldn't do five years ago. I mean, in all fairness, according to certain parts of Newgrounds, there's still things I can't really do now. But I think it's pretty interesting that we're beginning to reach a point where we're able to have those discussions. It's also really cool to be able to talk about emotion. Uh, one of my favourite games, uh, I find it hard to play because I really dislike the ending, but one of my favourite examples of game design that builds around emotion and using very clever, well-designed mechanics to teach people about heavily emotional experiences, Papo and Yo. Hands up how many of you have played it? Papo and Yo is a platform puzzler game about a giant monster and a little boy. And a little boy solves puzzles, giant monster helps him solve puzzles. Giant monster also occasionally eats weird green frogs and becomes a giant flaming demon beast. And it seemed like such a simple thing, it seems so straightforward, uh, you know, helpful enemy, jobs are good and no mechanics deeper than that. Except it turns out that game, as you get through it and further through it, and it eventually reveals to you that this is not just a game about a young boy and a giant monster, but a game about the designer and what it was like for him to grow up being raised by a father who is a violent alcoholic. Again, something we couldn't really done five, ten years ago, but something that's important and something that's scary and something that we need to talk about. And it's awesome that video games get to do that. The other thing is mental health, and I talk about this a lot, so I'm not going to rehash it. Um, but effectively, I think it's pretty amazing just how many more discussions I've had about mental health since Depression Quest came out. That's been incredible. Uh, to watch the shift and to be able to teach people about things that are incredibly complicated. Anyone that suffered through stuff like that knows that sometimes it's just impossible to find the words to describe stuff like that. But if you can have someone sit in front of a video game that doesn't allow you to take certain actions depending on the level to which you are depressed, you understand it as a system. And by understanding it as a system, you can finish the game, turn around, and look at the person that showed you that video game and go, wow, that was really fucking hard. And then they can be like, yeah, I know. It is. And that's really important. Of course, the other thing I want to talk to you about is the cool stuff that video games do that I think is a little more ridiculous. So, I'm aware that I've discussed this before. <laughs> I'm aware that this is not quite as emotionally charged as the first third of this talk and not as deep. But the brilliant thing about video games and why I like talking about them is that quite frequently video games talks and video games talks events tend to discuss things that are very serious and that's important and it's powerful and it's interesting. We learn a lot from that. It's important not to forget that we can talk about this shit. Because I did a lot of things in Skyrim. A lot of really cool things. I've seen a lot of really weird mods. I'm now incredibly scared of Thomas the Tank Engine. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, they replaced all the dragons in Skyrim. Or the main dragon at the very least with Thomas the Tank Engine. But I really remember the talking dog because it was just such a video gamey moment. But it was incredibly well written, was actually far better written in my opinion than the main quest. The amazing thing about video games is that you get to do that, not only as a designer, but as a player. Sadly, I wrote the next slide with a sp uh, special person in mind, but he's not here. It's the first time I think he's not been here in about half a year, so I'm really disappointed, but Now, we've gone round and round this every, like, every time I brought this up, a lot of people hate the Mako car. Personally, I think it's pretty good. For a lot of similar reasons, you may notice that the reasoning is somewhat similar. But 
Despite all the jumping and the ridiculous physics and things like that, what was amazing to me about the Maker and why I like talking about mechanics like that and why I highlighted that is that in the middle of a game that was constantly about talking or shooting or running around or making noise or attacking things or trying to talk people down from terrible mistakes, there were sections in the game where you could just drive around in silence and not be bothered. There was a point in the game where you could land on the moon and look up silently at the earth. And no video game has ever given me that opportunity before. And that was really important to me because at that point that video game became a really safe space for me because it was really calm and nice and sometimes when you're at a point in your life where your own life isn't nice or calm it can be really important to have those experiences and also to talk about them so people can realize that it's okay to value video games in that way that was my favorite memory and i talked about this at christmas for those of you that don't remember we couldn't find a controller to play the end of Final Fantasy VII as kids, and all we had was a plastic roll-out PS1 dance mat. Which is the greatest fucking insult to those game designers that we could have possibly committed, short of Rule 34, because it just turned it into a bit of a joke. But the wonderful thing about it was that it took a system that I couldn't stand, because I love Final Fantasy VII. Re it's like a really slightly unhealthy degree, but I can't stand the random battle system. And I'm not a big fan of the way X-Combat works in general, but that made it fun and ridiculous, and it was an incredibly special memory. And it's also quite interesting because it's a discussion of the way that we can break games and make them more amusing as a result, and the way we can alter games and repurpose them for our own amusement. If people weren't fucking around with games in a way that they weren't supposed to be used, in theory, or a way they weren't originally designed to be used, stuff like Dota wouldn't exist. And it's pretty important to remember that. Why should you care? Why should you care that we talk about this stuff over and over again. Why should you care that I'm rambling at you now? And why should you care that all the other talented speakers that are here tonight and who have been here every month since this started keep talking about this stuff? Because for a lot of us, video games are an escape. One of the things that I find I have in common with people, whether they tell me initially or much further into our friendship, is that everyone has that one game or a handful of them that they play when they're not feeling good or they're playing when they're feeling stressed or that they want to play when they want to feel like they're accomplishing something. And it's pretty awesome that we have a community built around that. There's a warmth in the video games community that I never found in the music community. It's weird. There's something, I can't quite describe it, but there's something wonderful about the fact that we are a bunch of people that are joined together by our commitment to interactive escapism. Because it makes us feel like we can do anything we want to do. Sometimes life is incredibly complicated, and sometimes you feel like you just can't get stuff done, whether that's trying to leave a mobile phone contract or trying to move between countries. Sometimes life can feel incredibly difficult, but it's fucking cool to be able to put a disc in a drive and go and save the world for half an hour. And to some people, that's incredibly valuable. And especially as designers, it's incredible to think about the impact we can have, especially on young children, of teaching them that they are valuable and special, and that they can save the world, and that they can accomplish these things. And not all their achievements have to be in things like football or maths, that they can have achievements in other areas, and that's also really important to me. And this is the other part. Because it creates spaces like this. Uh, Video Brains is like no other talk event I'm aware of. It's super friendly. Like, I do a lot of talks. I do a lot of talks. Um, this is the only one I've ever done on a regular basis, but the weird thing about this one is that it's got a really strong family vibe to it. I really like that. And it's got all of this. 
And that's really important as well. The best thing about video brains is... <laughs> I said I wasn't going to get all shaky, but the best thing about video brains is that it's really incredibly open-minded. One of the most awesome moments I had here was I had a student who was really interested in talking somewhere but never done it before, who wanted to discuss video games, and he never got to do that. So I said to him, go and pitch to Jake, send Jake an email, and do it because I want to know what you have to say. Because I've been talking at you for fucking months. It'd be really interesting to see what you say back. And he did. And he turned up and he gave a talk. And it was one of the best talks I've ever seen here. Uh, it was brilliant. I, I would say it made me cry, but to be honest, like if you put strings in a commercial for a car, there's a chance I'm going to be really shaky by the end of it. <laughs> so ignore me. But it was wonderful to see him do that. And I feel like this is the sort of event that gave him the platform to do that. And the weirdest thing about it was that I got to talk every month. And that was just super fucking cool. Uh, it made me more confident in front of groups of people. It made me feel better about myself. Uh, it made me a better speaker. It made me a better games critic. Um, it gave me new ideas for video games. It introduced me to new people. One of the most wonderful things about video brains is how friendly everyone is, but also how respectfully friendly everyone is. I do a lot of highly emotional talks, but people always ask before they hug me after these talks. No one ever does that at any other event, and I think that's pretty amazing, and it's a sign of the sort of crowd that we have here. Cheers. Please sit down. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, to be honest, any questions you ask me look fucking weird, so I think we'll skip it. But yeah, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it, and have a good night. So, I don't know, I wasn't planning on saying anything, and now I feel like I should talk something, I guess? I don't know, I feel kind of shy now. I mean, it's, it's a well-known fact that I don't really get emotional about anything. Not even Christos Crab walking past me. But I, I, I mean, it's, I guess it's important to say where I was. So like last September, I'd done kind of the occasional fan site work. I hadn't really done anything in the games industry at all. Um, and I remember trading a couple of emails with Christos back and forth and saying, here is a thing that I'm going to do. Do you want to help me with it? And I didn't know Christos at all. I'd met him like once in passing while moving very quickly in the other direction. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, I knew him on site as sprinting past, but we didn't know each other at all. And I mean, it, I guess it was, so he took a chance. He said, yeah, I'd love to be involved. And I said, well, you should have emailed me about two weeks ago, mate, because all of the talker slots are filled. Um, but I'd still love to have you involved somewhere. Like, I mean, clearly, the, beyond being a tardy emailer and atrocious at timekeeping and the worst pitch sender I've ever seen, I think I'd like to talk about Grim Fandango this month. OK, what about it? Grim Fandango, I'll come up with something new at a time. Um, <laughs> He said, oh, cool, I'll come along and I won this panel. And so he came along and it was great. And then he said, oh, I'd really like to give a talk the next month. And I was like, well, this is fantastic because clearly I've not fucked up bad enough that, you know, games industry people don't want to go anywhere near the event. So he came along and that went down really well and everyone loved it. And he, I said, hey, you should pitch again. And then I was like, actually, let's skip this really boring pitch process. And why don't you just come along for six months and see what happens? And here we are at the end of six months. I mean, we get 80, 90 people, like everyone is vaguely keen to come. I don't know, I mean, I sell some tickets, you're all here, you all pay me money, right? Um, 
And I feel like a large part of that isn't me or anything I really kind of tried to put in. It's Christos's talks have given us kind of an anchor to build the community around. And I, I, I guess while doing that, we've also become really strong friends. I mean, there's been a lot of personal stuff that I've gone through, and I've been struggling a lot with depression during this time. So, you know, high five depression, buddy. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I guess, you know, he's, he's been there for me both personally and kind of in the context of video brains. And so I guess it's really important what I'm trying to say and could have said at the start to skip it all is thanks. You've done a lot. Thank you. <laughs>